Hi everybody, I'm here to talk about how to introduce incompatible changes in Python and if, of, if possible how to mitigate the risk of incompatible changes. So my name is Victor Stine, I'm contributing to Python upstream and uh, downstream for Red Hat. Downstream means that I maintain the Fedora and Rail operating system and upstream means to fix issues in Python upstream. I'm a core developer for 13 years. I'm a happy Fedora and Vim user, and uh, sadly, I went through many incompatible changes since 13 years. So first, I would like to come back a little bit to the past, how we did the migration using the D-Day EPA migration. So a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was Python 2. Let's travel 15 years in the past before Python 3. So for the one who don't know, we had a language called Python 2 before, and we had some, some issues in that language. And the first one is that um, uh, 15 years ago, Django became more and more popular, it became a good competitor to PHP frameworks, but they wanted to use a Unicode for anything related to text, and the problem is that um, as soon as you use Unicode in uh, Python, you get into troubles. It means that if you deploy your application on production, everything is fine. Until a single user put a single non-ASCII character, you will get an error, but you don't know exactly where, because you don't exactly control how Python decides between bytes and Unicode. And uh, in general, in Python 2, it was um, a very frequently asked question. So in Python 2, the string ABC is a byte string. It's not characters, but bytes. And uh, if you concatenate a byte string on a Unicode string, which are non ansci you get a Unicode error. And uh, yeah, just in short, getting Unicode correctly in Python 2 was very troublesome. So what we decided is that uh, in Python 3, we moved to the correct solution by default which is that most people actually want to process text in a Python, so we want to use Unicode for everything, and it becomes a first-class uh, citizen in Python 3, because if you declare a single string like ABC, this one now is a string of characters. But the trouble is that um, if you have a large application like Django or Zope or, or Mercurial or anything which is based on Python 2, so written with the assumption that all strings are bytes. Moving to Unicode at once is uh, very complicated because you have to rethink for each function, each input, each output, what do you exactly want? Is, is it more appropriate to use bytes or to use Unicode? And the second issue is that you cannot decide that uh, on an incremental way when you migrate from Python 2 to Python 3. You have to fix all your Unicode issues at once. And um, Python is also a very old language, and uh, we added slowly, uh, one by one, some features. Like, for example, in Python 2.2, we introduced the cool concept of iterators, the PEP 2.3.4, and also generators, uh, the PEP 2.5.5. And the problem is that uh, in Python 2.0, that thing did not exist. So the existing function, like the built-in map, and a zip function return actually a list. And the problem with a list, if you have a large uh, data set, it consumes a lot of memory just to create the temporary pre, uh, list, just to process uh, the output that you are likely to iterate on it. So what we come up is a new module called Iter Tools, which uh, contains many recipes, many functions to process everything as iterators and uh, generators. And for example, you have to replace map and zip with imap on I, izip. But um, the trouble is that you, you have to migrate your existing code one by one, and it was uh, a long uh, process to do that, and the advantage was not al always obvious. And so it's the same for dictionaries. When you have a dictionary and you want to iterate on the pair of uh, key value, you have the um, items method, but th this one also returns a list. So we added a second method called iter items. So <clears throat> we decided to start from a, 
from a new language which, is, which has better defaults. So in Python 3, we decided to move to generators by default uh, for the map and zip um, in built-in function. And for the items method of the dictionary, it also returns a generator by default. And if you really want a list instead of the generator, you just have to cast the output to a list. And that's it. So the idea of uh, Python 3 is that we collected um, everything that we didn't like, the bad pattern, and we tried to address them all at once. And the idea would to have a uh, good same default behavior. For example, use Unicode by default, create generators by default, and I would say that the language become consistent again because we, we saw many new features in Python 2 which made the language a little bit inconsistent and now uh, we ha you have the good default and it just works. So just a minor issue at the end. Oh, it's backward incompatible. Oops. Um, so why do we, do we have incompatible changes in Python? So we have a pep of um, Python, uh, the Zen of uh, Python, the pep 20, which say that there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. And this uh, principle is very strong in Python, which means that we have a consistent coding style. Python is easier to teach and easier to review Python because most people have the same code, so you can compare code between colleagues and even before between projects. So what we said for Python 3 is that to make everything consistent again, uh, we have a very simple plan. Everybody has to run a, a tool which uh, automatically converts everything from Python 2 to Python 3. You do it once, you're good. Almost. Uh, we had some troubles, which are dependencies. This is something that we didn't plan. Uh, actually, when you have a large application, everything is not in a single code base. You have things called dependencies. Today, uh, we are more, more used to it with uh, PyPI, but before, there was already something like that. And uh, the problem is how do you migrate your application if the dependencies are not um, prepared for Python 3? Because if you have a single dependency which is not compatible with Python 3, you have to port all dependencies, which have also dependencies. It can be a very long tree. And the second issue is that when you run the tool 2 to 3, it's really a single way path. So you, you go to Python 3, okay, but you cannot come back. This is a one way option. And uh, when we propose that to dependency maintainers, they say, no, we, we have the majority of our user on Python 2. I don't see the, the, the advantage of migrating to Python 3 because all Linux distribution are using Python 2 and we are fine with Python 2, so we, we wait until some other people migrate. And uh, for all these reasons, the migration didn't took one day as I planned, but 10 years. And uh, then comes a second thing in Python, it's called the C API. So the C API is used by many third party C extensions to extend the Python language. And I think that the C API is the key of the Python uh, success because uh, thanks to that, if you are limited with the Python language, you can easily plug your existing very uh, 50 years old Fortran code for NumPy. You can plug your favorite um, graphical toolkit application um, quite easily. It's very easy to write bindings. It's very easy to call existing function. And um, yeah, if you have no C API, there is no Cyton, there is no NumPy, there is no uh, scientific stack, there is no PsychoPG, the driver for PostgreSQL. And um, and uh, another problem is that in Python 3.11, we made many optimization work in Python, but to be able to optimize Python, we had to make some subtle changes in the C API, especially in uh, objects which are related to code execution. So the code object, the frame object, and what we call the thread state, which contains the state of um, all Python internals. 
And the problem is that, um, as usual, people actually use it. And uh, they use it for many different things. And they use directly this uh, structures. And there is no abstraction between the um, internals and how people use it. So these changes broke a few C extensions. So for example, instead of accessing directly to the f underscore code of a code object, you have now to call a, a function, which is pi code get code. To get a previous frame, you have to, to call pi frame get back. And to get a frame from a thread state, you have to call the pi thread state get frame. And another problem is that this function are new in Python 3.11, but you don't have this function in 3.10. Okay, I saw how we did things in the past, and now I would like to see what, what is the present solution and how we managed to have a little bit smoother API updates. So first of all, about Python 3, uh, the migration from Python 2 to Python 3, there was a new module called 6, and this one uh, is very helpful because you can have a single code base to port your application, so you, you use the 6 module, it works on Python 2, and it works on Python 3. And this is very, um, a very practical solution and very helpful because previously people started to, they started to fork the project and to have two different names. It, will, it was very annoying because you had different dependencies depending on the Python version, or some bugs were, were fixed in one version and not the other. So having everything in a single code base is a key for the for successful migration. And the other idea of the six module is that instead of having to merge, uh, to, to migrate everything at once to the Python 3, you can migrate your file one by one using the six module, and it is uh, more incremental. And also we decided that uh, the D-Day approach should be abandoned because it didn't work because of the old issue that I said. And we learned from, from our mistake. About um, incompatible changes, there is also a new practice, is that we are trying to make incompatible changes as early as possible in the development cycle. And when we see that um, we break too many things, we open a discussion to say that, okay, maybe this change can be reverted and we can wait maybe one or two years until more people get uh, used to the new API. And the problem of Python 3.10 is that uh, when it was released, Python 2.7 was just, um, the support would just ended and some projects still had to support Python 2 and Python 3 and they didn't want to drop Python 2 support right now. So we made a few reverts to, to give more time to this project to migrate. For example, uh, we remove the U mode for the open function because this one has no effect on Python 3 and it was deprecated for 10 years. And also the um, aliases of the collection module, um, for also for many, many years it was deprecated, but keeping the code didn't was a big maintenance burden, so we decided to keep it in one release, but to remove again in the next release. And the main idea of this process of making incompatible changes early and make reverts um, during the development is to give more time to people to adapt the code uh, because we know that we have users and we try to be respectful to, for, to our users. To give some example on Python 3.11, we also reverted the removal of uh, Unicode aliases because again, we had uh, many aliases deprecated for many years. People didn't pay attention to the deprecation warning, so we reverted that change for one more release. And also, the, um, there were aliases in the config parser and some functions. And the async core module, I'd expected that uh, nobody would still use it, but in practice, it's still used for different reasons. And moving to async IO or other option is not that easy. And um, these three changes got reverted, uh, but we did it again in the incoming Python 3.12 uh, release. The problem of these uh, changes is that they affected too many packages, and it takes too much time to fix them. 
So to, to decide about a change in Python, we have a, a process for that. It's called the PEP387, the deprecation process. And um, we had some conflicts between this existing PEP and the new um, release process in Python, because in Python 3.9, we decided that we are going to release a little bit faster. Instead of having a release every one year and a half, we are going to have a release every October, so once per year. And the old deprecation process was um, fitted to the old release cycle, um, because we had like one year and a half to remove a function. And with the new uh, release process, it was only one year to remove a function. And we noticed that one year was too short because people don't read the documentation, they don't pay attention to the warnings, or just they have different life duties. So what we did is to, to update these documents to, to require to deprecate something for at least two years. So this is a bare minimum, but obviously you can deprecate a function for longer. And for example, if you deprecate a function in 3.11, it has to stay deprecated in 3.12, and we are only allowed to remove it in 3.13. So three, it takes three years in total. About the deprecation warning, um, it was decided to hide them by default in um, 210, because uh, we noticed that most of our users are actually users and not developers and they don't know how to deal with these warnings because only people who have access to the code know how to modify the code, really care about it. So the idea is to make it more pleasant for users and uh, give the access to um, this warning to developers who can enable these warnings. We made a tiny change in Python 3.7, is that when you uh, write a script, these warnings are shown by default but only in the main script, in the main module. So to display a warning once, what you have to do is to use a dash w, w default to see the warning once. To treat uh, every kind of warning as an, an, uh, as an error, you can use error instead. Or you may want to try the development mode of Python, which is dash uppercase uh, dev. And this one not only show warnings, but also enable more uh, features, uh, more checks at runtime, which are very helpful for developers. And um, if you get too many warnings, you can dig into the warnings documentation to see how to filter some warnings to only see the one that you care about. So what we are trying to do in Python now is to have what I would call a smooth uh, deprecation. So the first point is to add the new way, the new API, deprecate the um, old way only in the documentation. We start to emit a warning at runtime. And uh, something which is very important for me is that we, we try to explain how to port existing code, which is using the old way, without losing support for the old version. And this is something new, because in the past, we just remove code, and you are on your own. Now we are trying to help users to actually propose a solution working on the old Python and the new one with a single code base. And making this exercise help us to see that, oh, actually, it's not that easy to have uh, exactly the same behavior with the old and the new way. So maybe you know, sometimes we, we have to rethink the, the change to, to have an even smoother migration. And once you're done with all the steps, okay, now you can actually remove the old way. What we also started to do is to run a code change. Um, so I, there is a script to download the source code of the 5,000 most popular project on the PyPI pro, um, repository. And once you have a, the whole source code on, on, offline, you can have a, this script to charge with a regular expression to see if an API is used in that code. And this work helps us to see how the API is used, how many projects are, are using it. And uh, once we identify the most popular project which use it, we try to either report the issue upstream, propose a fix, or to, to come up with a solution for them. 
And you can find the script on my um, GitHub repository. So for me, uh, ideal migration would be first to add the new API, document the change, and provide a tool to help the migration, to identify and update all affected projects, or the majority of affected projects, and if possible, that would be the ideal case, to wait for a release. Because if the release of the, um, of the fix comes after Python, there is a delay between the new Python version and uh, the tool which is co compatible with the new Python. So once uh, all affected projects uh, get a release, you can deprecate the old API, remove the, uh, the old API, and um, the issue with that process is that it's quite slow. It takes between three and five years, and sometimes we want to move faster. So we are trying to fit into that uh, migration path, but sometimes it's too slow. <clears throat> and a very recent change, recent means uh, two weeks ago, I defined uh, what I call the soft deprecation. And the idea of the soft deprecation is that this one doesn't imply to remove a function. It's a way to mark a function that, oh, you should no longer use it to new projects, but it's perfectly fine to continue using it for all the project because it's still tested, it's still supported, um, we have still the documentation. And not only it's not, um, there is no removal, which is scheduled, but also there is no uh, warning at runtime. And this is also something very important, is that more and more projects are tested with the warning uh, are checking for warnings in the test suites. So the idea of the soft deprecation is to mark something as deprecated, but not affect uh, any project because the deprecation is only in the documentation. Um, and and it, I told about the code church in the most popular PyPI project, but sadly, we don't have access to every project in the world, and um, some some core Python dependencies have um, also a single and unavailable maintainer. So even if we find the, um, the project which is affected, we propose a fix. Sadly, sometimes it takes a few months, a few, a few years to, to get a fix. And there can be many reasons. The maintainer can be busy with work, with other life duties, get bored about the project, get sick, or it can be someone of uh, a friend of someone of his family, of her, her family. So it's not about the bus factor of people get his, but hit by a bus. There can be many, many reasons, like also burnout. So how can we update this project if the maintainer doesn't reply? I have no solution for that. Uh, there is also the problem of funding the open source project. Maybe some of them are aware of that. Big companies are relying on uh, key dependencies, but there is no funding for that. And uh, also, maintaining this project is a thankless work. work. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, about projects which are developed behind closed door, we don't have access to the source code, so we don't know if they are affected or not. They can be short script or very large application, and um, Sometimes there are very old projects which are no longer maintained. There is also turnover in the, in the team, so people who knew how the code was working are long, no longer in the team. So for that project, there is a script for Python, which is called PyUpgrade. So you can run the script and uh, get some automated change for the new version of Python to make it compatible with the new Python. And for the C API, I've wrote a script called PyUpgrade a Python C API, which adds support for the new Python version without losing support for the old Python version. Or at least you have one solution, which is not great, but works. You just keep an old version of Python, but be aware of the security. So about the C API, what I did is to write a new tool to provide new functions of the, uh, of the new Python version to the old version of Python. So the idea is that you only use the new names but you, you have these new functions on your old Python version. So I created this Python three years ago, and I created the script to automatically update your C application with the new names, and I had to add support for Python 2, so Python 2 is still supported because I needed the support for the Mercurial project, 
which didn't finish his uh, migration to Python 3. And uh, last year, I added many functions for Python 3.11, but in the meanwhile, I added functions for Python 3.12 and even now 3.13. 13. At least 10 projects are using it, and you can find the documentation online. So the idea is that you update the C, the C extensions to use the new functions, and uh, you copy the header file into your project, and once you did this change, you don't have to update the header file anymore because un unless you use new functions, there is no need to update that file. And as I said, it still supports Python 2.7. Uh, what we also did for the C API is to d define new guidelines to avoid issues that we had in the past and issues that we want to get right, uh, at least to avoid this issue when we add new functions. For example, a function must not return borrowed references. We should avoid to steal references, and we should define the ownership rules on the lifetime of arguments on structure members. And uh, the idea is that if we follow this new guideline, it should be easier to, to support the C API on the Python implementation other than C Python. We also try to reorganize the header file in three different categories. So what you call the limited API, which is related to the stable API, the public C API, and the internal API. And the internal is the one that you should not use, and now it's well separated. I'm a little bit out of time, so I'm going a little bit quicker. So the future. The future would be to, to spend more time to think about a stable API, and this one already exists since Python 3.2. And the idea is that you build your C extensions once and you don't have to change your binary anymore because uh, the ABI is stable, you can distribute a single binary and it's just fine. And we made some uh, changes to check the, the ABI and to better document it. And there are two well-known projects which are cryptography and PySide which are using it. So there is a new C API called HPy and this one is designed to work to be efficient on, on PyPI, and it also works on, on C Python, and you can decide uh, if you want the best performance, so to get access directly to the C API of Python, or to have something called the Universal ABI, which provides a single binary working on all Python version, all Python implementation. And the idea is that you have single API, so it's uh, quite convenient. And there is a work in progress uh, port uh, for the NumPy project to use it. And that this is something for you. Uh, please test over uh, alpha release. Please test over beta release. And at least try to test the release candidates and provide feedback as soon as possible because we need to know about your issues. If we know about your issues earlier, we have more time to fix your issues to help you to migrate. So it's very important for us to have the feedback as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you for, the, for your insights on compatibility on, on multiple levels, actually. We have maybe time for one question. So there are two microphones in the room, um, or you can ask your questions in Discord, which is also possible. Thank you very much, Victor. One question, do you know if anybody has experimented with depreciation by slowdown? So still provide the API or the function, but slow it down by a factor of whatever? I know that the Linux kernel is doing that for the old API to motivate people to migrate. And um, so far we didn't decide to decrease the quality of the old API on purpose. Uh, there is no need for that. We just help people to move to the new one, and uh, if possible, we try to support the old and the new API. But yeah, we are, sometimes we think about this idea. Introducing memory leaks or crashes, random bugs. Thank you very much. Please give another round of applause for Victor. Thank you.